looking at. We've got this with a two cell tower. I'm standing with my toes on one cell and my heels on the other cell. Okay. Um, notice the fans. One fan per cell. Notice the piping. Uh, one of the limitations, one of the issues we're can happen in cooling towers is the flow distribution gets on. We'll actually look at that, we're actually logging that in. <clears throat> These towers would be harder to correct that because there isn't any one valve you can close to isolate a tower. The headers serve each cell versus a header serving one cell and the second header serving the other. Uh, if you look at these visually, and I don't know how the camera will pick it up, but Neil and I are pretty sure the fans are running at different speeds too. Uh, which may mean they aren't getting the energy savings they think they're getting by the cube rule. Uh, you'll notice that the balance valves are throttled 45%. So somebody actually, and I know the guys here, they actually work pretty hard to get the flow distributed uniformly by balancing. The problem is, this is a much this system, the balance valves don't work like they would in a normal system because of the dynamics of flow. At very low flow rates, this pipe's like a sewer. It's not cool. And so at a really low flow rate, and, and I have another, there's a whole video I have about this. But think about just a little trickle of water coming up. It's just going to fall, right? It, it does, it's not going to jump the gap to flow equally to the basins. And so until the flow is high enough for this valve to actually start backing the level up in this T, the cell right here is going to get favored with flow. Only until there's enough flow in the system to back the water up to the level of the T, we you start to get flow in the other cell. And then this really weird thing happens. You know the flow, the volume's coming up, but this still holds steady while the other cell gets it until you fully pressurize the pipe. And in the other video, actually, I have a video of that happening and a graphic complaining and stuff like that. So you can watch that. So the reason that matters is if there was a low flow condition that actually didn't have water in that basin, you wouldn't want to be running that fan. But in the other video, that's the exact issue. I noticed there was no flow over the cell, but the fan was running. So, real easy, low-hanging fruit, it seems. But actually, there's some constraints that made it not so easy to capture when we talk about that video. So I'm building dramatic tension on so you go watch this video. Okay. So, Sebastian and I got really curious. So, let's just look at this basin here. The way the water comes into the basin, goes into a manifold right here and the manifold has a slot at the bottom that forces the water to spread out across this basin and then if you look this basin has this little dam it's called a weir okay and so the water until the water gets deep enough to flow over the weir which is just starting to happen in this basin until it gets deep enough that's going to force all the water to this end of the basin, which is the incoming side of your air. It's the incoming side of the basin. These black things are the metering orifices that control the flow and distribution of water out of the basin over the fill. And we have another video where I actually have a model of the tower and we look at how all that's put together. As the flow comes up, eventually it reaches the depth of this weir and then it cascades over and starts you know, feeding those nozzles. The reason that matters is if the fill gets dry at one side and it's flat in the middle, there's much less resistance to airflow and the air basically short circuits through the fill and the tower performance is compromised. It also is hard on the life of the fill for a, a reason called total evaporation, which I, I talk about in the other video. Uh, now, right now on this tower, Basin further away from me, which you'll notice is further down the pipe, you'll notice the level here isn't the same as the level was in the other basin, which means 
basin that's behind me right now is getting more water than this basin. The good news is this weir is making sure what water it is getting is distributed across the face of the fill. If the flow rate gets low enough, some of these orifices would start to get exposed. So what we've done, we've basically got this little pipe stand, and these are basically two standard hobo thermistors for an onset logger. <coughs> Excuse me. And we were trying to, we're logging basically digital flow information based on temperature. So right now, both of these thermistors are just about, the bottom one's almost out of the water, this one is. So if the thermistor is in the water, it'll be at the temperature of the condenser water return, which we're logging independently. As the level changes, these thermistors will see the temperature change. And so between this little stack right here and this little stack over here, we can sort of paint a rough picture of what's going on with the depth of water in this basin. That's what we're trying to do. It's actually the first time I've tried this. It was I didn't have the idea until we were working on this drum. I knew about the problem. I just never thought about how could I log it without spending a fortune. So if the flow drops really low on this basin, what you'd see happen, let, let's start start with the basin's you know full at design flow. All four sensors would be immersed, and so the temperatures should match. As the, as the flow dropped off, the first thing that happened is this sensor come out of the water, so all of a sudden its temperature would be different. It might be higher, it might be lower, depending on how cold or hot it is outside, but it will be different. As the level continues, meanwhile these two sensors would be flooded because this dam's holding the water back, this weir. As the level continues to drop, the next thing that happened is this sensor would be out of the water. And so when this basin is basically running dry in this area, both of those semesters will be out of the water and read about the same temperature, whereas the, the ones over on this pipe stand, over on this side of the cell, they'd still read the condenser water return temperature. If the flow continued to drop off, since this is the furthest point from the manifold in this particular cell, then the water would start moving back this way, the top sensor would come out of the water, and then finally the bottom sensor would come out of the water. And I think, if I, I might be getting my towers mixed up, I think I have a picture actually where in this tower there's only flow to these orifices and these are basically dry. Um, so this is a BAC tower. BAC uses weirs with poplars back. Marley uses cups. And the way the cups work, it would be the opposite. These orifices wouldn't have a cup and these would have basically what amounted to a little pipe that stuck up this high. So the water would have to get that high before these orifices would start to get flow. So that's how Marley does it. So we're talking about a pump test for flow. Oh yeah, um, I can feel the line of these. So there's actually kind of a trick. So now your the question becomes, well, how do we know what the flow is when all this stuff happening? If you have a constant flow system. You can actually do a couple field tests that will let you know. Look, this system has three pumps on it. The middle one's a redundant pump. In fact, if you look at the butterfly valves, they have the middle one set up right now to back up the pump closest to the camera. See the little, little triangles on those orange things? The orange things are actuators on butterfly valves. And if the triangle is perpendicular to the pipe, that's just like the position of the butterfly inside. So the valve closest to the camera is set up open, the valve furthest from the camera is set up closed. And if you <coughs> excuse me, you trace this pipe out, one of those lines where it goes through the wall goes to chiller A, the other pipe goes to chiller B or chiller 1 or chiller 2, whatever they call them. And so the middle pump right now is set up to back up the pump, the, the pump that was closest to the camera. So where I'm heading here, these pumps are either on or off. They aren't at variable speed. So there's only three potential operating states. Given the redundant pump, you could have chiller A's pump running, or you could have chiller B's pump running, or you could have chiller A and chiller B's pump running. 
and they may interact because they share a header. And so the pressure drops, the flow changes affect the pump, op the pump operating point a little bit. That's actually another opportunity. If you have a really long piping run on a variable, a constant volume system with multiple pumps that are staged, you actually don't have a constant volume system problem because the pressure drop due to flow changes from each operating condition. And that can be like a one job with a 1,200 ton chiller plant that was worth $13,000 a year because most of the time one chiller only ran and the other pump would weigh out its curve as a result. Anyway, where I'm heading is there's only three distinct operating states. So if you do three pump tests and know which pump's running, then you also know the flow rate that's moving in the system at that pump. And so you can correlate that information with our level data here and with a lot of things. And you actually know quite a bit from a fairly simple field test. And we're, we're logging fan amps, so we sort of know what the fans are doing. All so, I guess that's about it. That's our tour. We'll start digging into these systems in a little more depth through a number of mechanisms. I might use my SketchUp model to get you inside a tower and to do some things. We may come back in this plan and take some videos. And show some data logger data. Yeah, well, yeah, the computer point out. Well, once we get the log data and I have some time, we'll actually correlate that data with what we're seeing here. We'll get the data from right now and see what that looks like.